Yo, Shortbox Nation, this is Botter, and I'm here to tell you right now that con season starts early this year with the return of Northeast Florida's premier anime, comic book, and sci-fi event, Collective Con. That's right, Northeast Florida's largest pop culture convention returns for its 10th year on March 8th through the 10th at the Prime Osborne Center in Jacksonville, Florida. 10 years of Collective Con, they're pulling all the stops out to make sure this is a can't-miss event. And the guest list they got going, don't even get me started on the guest list. I mean, they've got A-list celebrity guests and voice actors from some of your favorite movies, anime, and video games like Elijah Wood and Sean Ashton, Ray Park, Trisha Helfer, Ross Marquin, Max Middleman, and bo herself would be there, Katie Sackhoff. Tell me what other convention is giving you the opportunity to meet Frodo and Sam from Lord of the Rings, Darth Maul, and One Punch Man all under the same roof. Only at Collective Con. And if you're looking to get some of your favorite comics signed, or if you want to get an original sketch from some of the best comic artists in the world, well, you're in luck because there'll be plenty of comic and creator guests there, like DC comic artist extraordinaire Clay Mann, Harvey Award nominated illustrator John Taylor Christopher, Marvel and DC cover artist Chris Stevens, and acclaimed Star Wars author Timothy Zahn. They'll all be at Collective Con this year. And if you're looking to bring the family or if you want to make a weekend out of it, you're in luck because there'll be so much going on at CollectiveCon that weekend in the form of vendors, fan panels, video game tournaments, cosplay contests, after parties, and a bunch of fan events. You can purchase single and three-day weekend passes now using the link in this episode's show notes or by going to CollectiveCon.com to book your tickets and hotel. Buy your tickets now and I'll see you at CollectiveCon, March 8th through the 10th. Now let's start the show. Are you Mandalorian? I'm a simple man making his way through the galaxy, like my father before me. Did you take the creed? I give my allegiance to no one. Mandalorian fans, Star Wars nerds, and our usual Short Box Nation listeners, welcome back. And for our first-time listeners tuning in, welcome to the Short Box Podcast, your soon-to-be favorite comic and pop culture podcast. I'm your host, Botter, and this is the sixth episode of our Mandalorian Season 2 Recap and Review Series. We'll be covering the latest episode, that being Episode 6, Chapter 14, The Tragedy. So consider this your spoiler warning for the rest of the episode. We'll be discussing important plot points and other Easter eggs going forward. Joining me today is a panel of talented co-hosts like my co-host here with me in the Short Box studio. Miss Blythe Brumleaf is joining us with a very appropriate Baby Yoda shirt today, might I add. Hi, hi. And my right-hand man, Cesar Cordero, is in the house. What if he doesn't survive the freezing process? He's no good to me, Dad. <laughs> I really need to work on my intros because I just say hello. And... Don't don't compare yourself to Cesar's <laughs> intros. He's he's been doing like very over the top ones since he's been on the show. You know what? That sounds like a slight on my character, good sir. No, not at all, man. Nothing but love. And last but not least, calling in from Tython himself is our favorite <laughs> Star Wars know it all, Mr. Lars Lundquist. Woo! What's up, y'all? My backpack's got jets. <laughs> Boba. The thing. A bounty hunt for Java Hut. You fine ass. My vet. Fuck <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just do a better job at uh, accounting for your jetpack. Just don't leave it hanging around like, like Mando Terrible. does this episode. Uh, before we get into the main event, I have some people to thank that help us pay the bills and inspire us to make the show happen in the first place. First up, this episode is brought to you commercial free by our sponsor, Gotham City Limit, Jacksonville's premier place for comics, toys, collectibles, and more. If you live in Jack, stop by the shop on Southside Boulevard and tell Ben the short box sent you. Lastly, this show is made possible in part by donations for our Patreon subscribers. The contributions from our patrons go a long way in ensuring this show's longevity and the continued production of episodes like the one you're enjoying now. If you're interested in supporting the show and earning our eternal gratitude and some awesome rewards along the way, visit patreon.com slash the short box to become a patron or click the link in the episode description. Speaking of patrons and supportive listeners, I want to give a special shout out to three people who've shared some positive remarks about these Mandalorian episodes we've done the last six weeks oh yeah a uh, big thank you to david morales aka oh, yeah. brother biscuit on, yeah. uh, on instagram that's a great instagram handle a I shout out it. to sergeant errol white oh and a big shout out to nick heiderberg <laughs> kangialosi they've all shared some really positive words of encouragement and compliments on the recent episodes and i just wanted oh. to return that back to our listeners so oh, that's nice man. shout out to you three nice. yeah uh, let's give it up one more time for our sponsor and patrons and get started on analyzing this episode of The Mandalorian, starting with the credits. This episode is written and produced by John Favreau and directed by Robert Rodriguez. There's several returning guest appearances in this episode that include Tamora Morrison as Boba Fett, Ming-Na Wen as Fennec Shand, Swoon, Giancarlo Esposito as Moff Gideon, 
Gina Carano as Cara Dune, and special cameo by Robert Downey Jr. as all three of the Dark Stormtroopers. You can't fool me, Favreau. I know who was in those suits. What? It's so you're so damn, dude! Right I really now. thought that was that joke was gonna hit. You like, can't fool me, Favreau. <laughs> Get out of here, dude! If, Ed, here, if Ed was here, it'd be the next ten minutes of just straight ripping me in half for yeah, that. You can't. I'm gonna just say it every time. All now. right, that was a terrible joke. I, no, I like right. it. No, 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 don't apologize. This episode finds the Mandalorian reaching the ancient temple of Tython, where he takes Grogu to the Seeing Stone so he can use the Force to find other Jedi's. But old acquaintances show up to settle unfinished business. The Mandalorian must team up with these unlikely allies to stop a small army from stealing the child. Blythe, in your opinion, what are the top three? Big moments and revelations we got on this episode as you get those notes ready. Yes, you gave me this assignment very last minute, but I came prepared. <laughs> True short box style, baby. True Come on. fashion, yes. So I have three themes. Not, I mean, they're kind of in order, uh, not really, but um, the first one is Grogu choosing his own destiny. So uh, he is obviously placed on top of the Seeing Stone. He's sending out a signal to the galaxy, to any Jedi, dark or light, and I think that that uh, moment will be revealed towards the end of this season, but we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. But choosing his own destiny, which I think is kind of a theme throughout this entire episode between Din and Grogu, but mostly Grogu in this moment. The other two is the new big three. We now have a... In the previous season, we saw with Kara and Grief Cargo, that was their little three. Now they have a new three with Finnick and Boba and Din all joining forces together. And then for the third one, the Empire is back. Those were my big three themes. I like that. Big three moments. Uh, Cesar, Lars, you guys want to add, what what were some of the big uh, uh, moments for you guys in this episode? I'll definitely say the exact same thing that Bly said about the the three, the new quote unquote new three. I like that in the first one. Granted, we we didn't know large picture that eventually uh, Cara Dune and Grief Cargo would end up being, you know, basically have have hearts of gold, right? Like they would end up doing the right thing in the end, right? But now you have a confirmed like a confirmed uh, emotionless killer in Boba Fett. Uh, who's got no problem doing anything just so long as the pay is good. And then you have someone who is now this, you know, kind of a cyborg with a code. You know, she's uh, she's a sharpshooter. She's an amazing sniper. And now they're also teasing that they're going to make Bill Burr part of the team as well. You know, like, it's like, okay, so now first season, the Mandalorian had his his ragtag crew of, you know, they're they're losers, but they're going to do it. They're going to get the job done. This one, it's like, it's a bunch of assholes you can't trust. And he's kind of stuck in a weird position. So he's like, well, fuck, now I'm on the other side of it. Which I wasn't a fan of this episode until that happened. Like, I'm like, cool. Okay, you got me back. You got me back. I'm interested again. Uh, I thought the biggest moment was the scene where you saw the fire spray. Uh Boba's Slave 1 fly across the the screen. And even though it was vague and it's like color and paint, like you couldn't really tell exactly because of how zoomed in it was, but you knew. And I thought that was like, that was my favorite. I was like, oh shit, here it is. I'll probably add and say the Razor Crest being destroyed, Mm. like really caught me off guard. That was like a very big. um, This is house. (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah that was his trailer home man like gone dude's houseboat got blew up yeah i was, man. I was not expecting i, I gasped I, when it happened yeah, yeah that was definitely a gasp worthy because mo- we've kind of watched it like you know go from hoopty to pimp my ride you know yeah. the star wars edition <laughs> yeah he was going everywhere like parked he- it in saint augustine Volano <laughs> beach that's <laughs> so you know it gets blown to shit yeah man that, that was definitely probably uh, one of the bigger moments that had me like whoa um and um my my boy Grogu, he's got a rap sheet now, man. Mm. Like he had tiny little cuffs put on his hand. I I, I wanted to fight my TV after <laughs> I saw that. How dare you? He was a little bit ass and, though. He sh- was uh <laughs> he was doing great though before that. I thought it was sick. Let us never forget. They shot a child on this show. <laughs> I was like, "What the fuck?" I told Blythe when they when they shot him with the stun gun. That's how I feel taking like Zequil or something. <laughs> like what? instantly, like put to sleep. <laughs> oh man! Um, and also, I, I never want a, a Moff Gideon ar- around my nephews or kids. Yeah, ever. he's gonna he's show just... him his gun collection. He's that weird <laughs> uncle that's like, "You ever seen an AR 15 <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I, th- I think between those two, for me, were, were probably the, the bigger moments. Seeing the Razor Crest being destroyed, and then uh, poor little Grogu, man. That that was, you know, I um, and, and first watch when I saw, you know, the title called the tragedy, I was like, man, that's a very dramatic title mm-hmm. compared to what we've kind of had previous, like the Ares, the Jedi, and things like that. Very like to the point. Um, and it wasn't until second rewatch that I was like, oh, okay, you know, they lived up to this. This is. What been... do you think the tragedy was? What do you guys think the tragedy was? I don't know I that thought it was. Oh, go ahead, Lars. I was just going to say Darth Plagueis came to mind. That's the first thing that came to right. mind. Right. That that was me. Like Order sixty six was was the first thought. Like, what could they possibly be referring to? But when you referred to the tragedy, I almost wonder if it's because it's that moment towards the end of the episode when Grogu is literally playing around with the dark side of Moth Gideon just lets it happen. And so in that moment, I almost think that maybe he's been swayed or, or persuaded to go to the wrong side because he is angry. He is fearful now. And, and we're seeing it play out. Broder? Damn, I, I literally took the, the title very serious. I was like, oh, the tragedy is him losing the Razor Crest. Damn it, you beat me. And, I was like, bro, and, and, and that's, that's the tragedy. I was like, like everybody's wrong. Yeah, no, they blew up his car. It's like very literal. They like, blew such a guy answer. car <laughs> and his house. He, he didn't even pay it off yet. Both of those are replaceable. <laughs> He's going to have to trade Grogu in his shoulder. Grogu is not. Oh, well, to, no, no, yeah, Grogu's important. Yeah, Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm saying. Just saying. He's going to have to trade in one of his shoulder pads. Okay, oh, dude, to fucking down. Well, maybe if fucking... he goes and finds the damn jetpack, he can pay for it. Look, a Honda CRV in this market <laughs> is really, really hard to find. Okay, especially in that part of the galaxy. I want to take a step back real quick and talk about some of these, uh, some of the Easter eggs and maybe cool findings. That, does anyone have any to share? Did anyone spot any? Lars, I'll go to you first. Um, I, I mean, one on, of the biggest. On. You things always go to Lars in... first, and he just tells all the Easter <laughs> eggs. <laughs> And then you're like, all right, uh, see? And it's like, yeah, I mean, nah, he fucking named them all. What do you, why would you even, I mean, you I'll know. make a note for next episode. So I, pick I one. It's okay. I don't, there weren't that many for, from my knowledge, the biggest thing and the biggest revelation, I guess, Easter egg is uh, Boba Fett's chain code that was in his gauntlet, which is crazy uh, because it's been, it's been uh, decrypted. And the stuff that's in it is just nuts. Um, it just tells a whole lot more about the past, and, and it brings in some old EU comics from 2002 that are, I guess, they're going to do something with and try to bring that into the fold of current continuity. But it's that's really exciting. That was the equivalent of like when my dad's like, "Boy, come over, let me learn you something." <laughs> like it, it was it's his chance to prove me wrong. He got something. the receipts. He yeah, yeah exactly, him. exactly. He was like, "Let me show you something." <laughs> This is my That's armor awesome. that my daddy gave He's like, me. Look, do you see this forearm? <laughs> this was on sale at Dick's Sporting Goods, 1991. Life, what about you? What Easter eggs do you got to share? I would say I'm going to stay in the same line of thinking with Boba, and I'm going to go with the Tuscan Raider little spear thing. I thought that those action shots were incredible, even better than the armorer's fight that we saw at the end of last season. I, I don't think that I've ever seen stormtroopers be decimated like what Boba did to these guys. I mean, there was one face that was just shattered. And then that one scene where you can see him like dragging it up against the ground and then he picks it up and smashes the guy's face in. You see the shrapnel flying. That was that was incredible. I feel like they might eventually let us in on how he learned how to fight because he fucking sucked in the original <laughs> movies. He was a fucking loser. And then like now it's like... <laughs> It's like he learned the hard way. Like he's like, no, nah, you ain't catching me off guard ever again. I'm never going to get bumped in the back of my backpack and fly into a damn monster's mouth. He freaking found the Bruce Lee equivalent of a sand person and was like, yo, teach me everything you know on how to fuck someone up with a gaffy stick. I need to know it right worked. now. And I think that that stick made a, a, a cameo in the first episode of the season because I believe one of the... Um, um, he uh, smacked t- the dude so hard it made a cameo in my fucking work week somehow. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I think that stick was used by one of the Tuscans to clean out yeah. the, the mouth of the Bantha in uh, episode it's a episode. Multi-use one. tool. Yeah, they all. They yeah, all absolutely. Have, <laughs> apparently, apparently, back me up, guards. They all. They all have gaffy sticks. Yeah, it's mm. their melee weapon. In a New yeah. Hope, whenever he, and uh, the prequels, when they're riding through the canyons on the speeders, like they're you know doing that call, shaking it over their head. It's you know how to do it. Don't even pretend. Yeah, come on, Lars, give it to us. Hit it. No. Hit it. <laughs> That's not it. <laughs> oh, I can't fucking do it, bro. I'm horrible at there this. Goes, great. There goes the sound bite. Thanks, Lars. For yeah, no problem. <laughs> Look how red he is. There he is. They can't see it. 
Um, see, what about you? You got any oh. Easter eggs to share? <laughs> My fa- <laughs> this whole episode was an Easter egg, man. Like, it's ridiculous. Like, Boba Fett showing up and then it's confirmed, right? It's basically as soon as you see his ship, you know, like, doo, 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 and it's flying through the air, it's like, oh, okay, that's Slave 2. There it goes, right there. That's fucking Slave 2. And then when it lands, it's like, all right, we. Let's see who comes out. Let's see who comes out of there. I do like that he wasn't like, I don't know. He didn't, he doesn't really have any beef with the Mandalorian. Like, he's just like, I just want my armor back, dude. So he wasn't like, you know, well, we have our, looks like we have ourselves a fucking standoff. What's going to happen? Like, he didn't posture. He didn't like bro up on anybody. He was just like, dude, I'm fucking old. Like, I was in a monster's mouth. It was licking on me. I had to learn from a Bruce Lee Tuscan Raider. I fucking Han Solo. Han Solo beat me in the back on accident, and I fell into a fucking sandworm. Give me a break, man. Can we just talk? Let's just talk. All right, everybody, put their weapons down. Let's just talk. I thought that was cool. I think, I think just everybody has kind of been waiting, right? Ever since you saw the footsteps in the first season, right? Those boots show up, and then a little bit of that cloak, and you're like, ooh, I wonder who that was, and then. Finally, finally, you see him. And it's like, it's like, I don't know, like all of this is like, basically, I don't, I don't know. It's weird when you say Easter egg, because an Easter egg is almost like a a wink. Like, you're like, oh, did you catch that one? Did you catch that? Did you catch that? All of the did you catch that's have a lot to do with the plot. So whether you caught it or not, it's going to pay off somehow in the in the future. So it's kind of weird. I don't know. The one that I caught was that Robert Rodriguez actually makes kind of a, a – his face shows up whenever Cara Dune is, is going through like the database looking for MIGs. Mm. Um, I think his face quickly shows up. So I thought that was kind of a cool way to you know have the, the director. An <laughs> and then the other thing I've got here is uh, – listed here is that this is now the shortest episode of the season uh, uh, beating out episode three – uh, for the title, if you guys remember, episode three, I think, was 33 minutes for a total runtime. This one beats it out by a minute 32. So it's among one of the shortest episodes um, for the series uh, in, in total. And I wanted to ask you guys, did it feel short to you guys? Because, uh, once again, this is another one where I felt like a lot of things transpired and it didn't feel like 30 minutes passed. No, it didn't feel like 30 minutes at all. It, it was one of those, similar to last week with Ahsoka, they just, from the jump, they get right into the action. And, and I think that that's what makes for as long as it feels like you're getting a lot of of information you're getting a lot of some lore you're getting some some story set up i i think that the 30 minutes was was more than fine i saw that it was 30 minutes when i started the episode and i was kind of like oh really all right another one of these little ones okay cool whatever and then when it was done i was just kind of like bizarre i mean this feels like how much is left in this episode i kind of had to pause it i'm like damn i feel like a lot has happened like there's a whole lot that's happened in this episode without really any kind of fluff. I didn't really notice the the amount of time. I mean, I definitely like when the credits came, it felt like that's where they should have been, you know, to end the episode while. Um, the pacing I thought was good. There there was no like open areas where I was like bored. It was it was a cool episode. I thought the flow was nice. Yo, this is Botter. Sorry for interrupting this episode, but I'll keep it brief. I wanted to let you know about a massive sale we have going on over at the Shortbox store on all of our merchandise and apparel. That's theshortboxstore.bigcartel.com. You can now save 20% off your entire order using the discount code YO, Y-O-O. So if you've been waiting for the right time to finally buy that gauntlet snapback, or if you ever wanted to buy any of the shirts you see me wear on the podcast, well, now's your chance to get them for a steal. We still have a few sizes left of everything, but they won't last long and once they're gone they are gone and then i mentioned that all of our apparel is screen printed on high quality material none of that heat transfer or direct to garment stuff our shirts are some of the most comfortable ones you'll ever wear and the hats look even better in person so wear your support for the short box nation proudly knowing that you're going to look damn good doing it get to the shortboxstore.bigcartel.com as soon as you can and don't forget to use that discount code Yo, Y-O-O, to save 20% off your entire order. All of this information can be found in this episode's show notes if you want to get there faster. Thanks for not pressing fast forward. Now back to the show.
See, I'm going to take it to you. Um, in your professional opinion, how did Robert Rodriguez, the director for this episode, do with his Star Wars directorial debut? I've seen a lot of reviews online regarding this episode, praising and echoing um, Rodriguez, uh, his, his confident directing. And I, I kind of I put quotation on confident because I've seen that word uh, used a few times in various publications. But I wanted to know what, what you think. Yeah, confident or, or lazy. Um, I, I did not like his directing. Um, I will say... <sighs> So his claim, I was, I was talking to Blythe earlier about this, that Robert Rodriguez's claim to fame, at least it used to be, was that he kind of was like out the gate a mixture of Sam Raimi and George Lucas. George Lucas in the sense that he didn't want to work within the system, so he created his own production company, um, Troublemaker Studios, or Los Hooligans originally. Sam Raimi was kind of the same thing as, and I say Sam Raimi because they both have budgetary restrictions early on in their history. Um, both those directors had zero money to make their movies and still did things that were innovative with camera work and shots and a little bit of special effects. Rodriguez delved in special effects, like making, you know, squibs that explode out of condoms. Um, so he's very, he has a lot of ingenuity. He's very smart. But as of late, um, he's gotten very, he's kind, of, he's kind of rested on his laurels, you know, like all of his previous accomplishments basically are attached to his name. So I think he knows that. And whenever you see his name, I feel like it's, it's, he's, he's like, yeah, this will get me by. Case in point, one, you have the entire Star Wars world and you're friends with Favreau and he's giving you money, right? And he's like, all right, this is the episode you are going to direct, right? Even if there were budgetary restrictions, Rodriguez could knock it out the park because that's kind of his thing. This episode, it felt like it was shot in his backyard. Like, there was one establishing shot where you see, like, ah, they're landing on this planet, and look at this amazing ancient structure. And then the next, it's like, they're in fucking Yellowstone National Park, just kind of walking around, and it's like, they didn't even bother to, like, throw, throw in an exotic-looking flower or something. Remind me that I'm in Star Wars. Don't just be like, yeah, by the way, uh, let's have this conversation over here, and you sit down. I, there was a fucking Costco behind the back scenes, you know? Like, I, was, I don't know. I wasn't really impressed with his cinematography. I wasn't impressed with his uh, camera shots. He knows how to tell a story with action. I mean, anybody that's seen Desperado can attest to that. But uh, thankfully, this was written by Jon Favreau. So the pacing of the episode was good and the dialogue was interesting. But just the, the, the composition, his camera shots and... I don't know. Just the visual look of everything was kind of bupkis for me. I think uh, Din Djarin kind of felt your, your your vibe a little bit, too, because as soon as he walks up to the seeing stone, he's like, does this look Jedi to you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, you know, it was just, it was bizarre, you know, like, I don't know. You know, it I, was the I, Sam's Choice version of an episode. Yeah, yeah. Huh. That, that's actually I, I didn't think about how maybe uh, some plant life or anim even animal just life. a and, and little bit. That's a good point, because, I mean, that, that was something cool about last episode. And, and I feel like all these episodes, they do such a good job of establishing like a very unique looking setting. I mean, even like last episode when he lands on, um, um, uh, the name of the planet escapes me at the moment, but, um, you know, he lands, it's a vastly different looking world from any of the ones we've seen. There's like no trees or at least all the trees there. Have been, there's no vegetation. There's those animals that like, you know, are, are home to mm -hmm. the planet. They're eating the trees. This one, you're right. was just kind of like hmm, a little more bland, I guess. Yeah. In I, comparison. I don't understand why I don't, I don't get it, but, it didn't again. Not a slight. I it just a nitpick. Okay, no, that's fair. Speaking of, of settings, um, and, and speaking of Tython, Lars, uh, out of curiosity, um, has that seeing stone and then you know Tython in general has it showed up in other Star Wars materials? Like, uh, what's the significance of it? Mm, Tython was uh, the last I remember. I think Tython was something in EU, but in current continuity, the last issue. So you know how Marvel Star Wars, they did the A New Hope, and then recently they did the Empire Strikes Back era stuff. All the stories that are going on at that time are mostly around that same era. The Afra comic ended, her last issue of her first series ended with her taking Vader to Tython. And from what I recall, it was a little while ago when I read it, I remember Tython being purple and like more like exotic looking in, in that. There's no seeing stone. Um... She was, from what I recall, she was trying to uh, take him off of a secret rebel bases like Scent and try to guide him away from, from them. 
but that's all I remember about that. And it could be a little inaccurate because I read that a while ago, but um, yeah, I remember Tython being a little more exotic from, from the panels, like purple stands out to me in my recollection, but it looked just like, uh, you know, an earth type planet, not much interesting about right. it. Yeah. They had some purple flowers. So maybe, you know, they were trying to do that. I understand minimalism. I get that. You know, I, I understand that, you know, they, they kind of want to make it a throwback show. I've mentioned it in the past, but like at least every episode, do, at least at least in the original Star Trek, like you knew they were filming in fucking that one desert in California that everyone uses that ginormous mountain rock to climb up on, you know, right where Kirk is fighting the Gorn. Everyone's used it. They used it in Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. Like, but at least, at least they do something to kind of remind you like, and by the way, this is an outer space on another planet somewhere. Like yeah. the the Jedi thing at the top was okay, but they didn't spend most of the episode there. It's like they're out in the you know the forest trying not to get fucked up by poison oak. <laughs> <laughs> and Lars, I I had asked that because I wasn't sure if like the Seeing Stone or, or Tython was some sort of a um, like tradition or a rite of passage for like young Padawans or just you know Jedi who are who are lost or whatnot. So it sounds like they kind of took some creative uh, freedom. With that it was aspect. supposed to be one of the first Jedi temples on Tython ever. So that could be just a rudimentary temple, you know, itself. Life, I wanted to go to you because you're someone who has stated before that your fandom for the for the Star Wars franchise is rooted in the later trilogy. I think you've gone on record saying mm-hmm. like you're, you're a fan of those later trilogies. The movies. Yeah, the movies. How did it feel seeing Tamora Morrison playing an unleashed Boba Fett? I think for me, what comes to mind is at the end of last week's episode, the Ahsoka episode, uh, we were watching some of the the recap videos. And I remember saying to myself, I don't really give a fuck about Boba Fett. Like, I don't, he was, from what I know of the movies, I know he was, you know, in in some of the cartoons. And and so for me, it was, I don't have an emotional attachment to him. So even seeing him in The Mandalorian, I'm like, I don't, okay, cool. Like, whatever. I, I don't feel one way or another but for me and my fandom it was nice to see him like go to fucking work and that's what he did in this episode and i thought that you know some of like the intense like up close looks of his face like you can see the scars you can see him looking back at the razor crest like going over to snatch his armor up and i thought that that was a nice touch that he took his old armor and put it on top of you know technically his new uniform hmm. which is the 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 Tuscan Raider robes and and that kind of weaponry so i thought that that was nice to see and then you, you can also see his little belly so he's kind of grown <laughs> into it yeah. I, so i thought that that was a really uh, a, a good introduction for somebody who isn't a boba fett super fan like a lot of star wars fans are yeah. this is the first time we're actually seeing this character fleshed out so props to the actor because he had to basically be like okay well I got to do what Boba Fett is for this show, which for me, and maybe you guys thought this, I don't know. Let me know if I'm on planet weird here. But I looked at, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm asking myself, why the fuck is Boba Fett here? Why are they fucking doing this? Other, I hope this isn't fan service. And then I was like, ah, they mentioned that he came from foundling ancestry. Mm. That's the connection mm. because the, Boba Fett is essentially going to be a reminder of what the Mandalorian could become if he doesn't have somebody like Grogu being his moral center slash reminding him like, hey, motherfucker, you have a conscience in a fucking gray ass world. Don't forget it. Hmm. Or else there but for the grace of God go you. You know, you might end up in a fucking Sarlacc pit if you just end up living your life for money or just for yourself, you know? There, There's Boba Fett. Like, that's why he's there. He's true neutral, hmm. to put it in D&D hmm. terms, right? He has no allegiances except himself. But in this world, and within the framework of what the Mandalorian's trying to say, can't live your life like that. It's, it's going to fuck you up. He probably had his come-to-Jesus moment when he essentially died, it's, and now right. it's changed him. Right. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Hopefully. Oh, you want me to spice it up a little bit? Spice it <laughs> up, yeah, boy! Okay, I'll, ch- I'll change it up a little bit, the tone of this. So I think just from that chain code that Boba exposed and what it says, it speaks of uh, Jango being a foundling and who found him, which is this uh, Mandalorian named Jaster Morell, who is one of the originators of the separation between Mandalorian and Death Watch. Hmm. So Death Watch killed um, Jaster. So there's this long history of the Fets hating Death Watch. 
And this, I think, will come into play later mm. whenever Boba realizes Mando is currently aligned with Death Watch and he's a foundling of the Death Watch. And I think there's going to be, this is more adding to the separation of the two different Mandalorian cultures and Boba and and Mando are going to have this big moment, I think, when they have to realize that maybe they aren't, maybe they're actually enemies. Mm. Um, there's a lot deeper stuff with just that chain code that popped up uh, that I think is going to pop up later. Hmm, that's interesting. You don't think he's over that by now? Hell because no. he's old and he's lived. Well, one, initially, he's not real. As you said before, he's technically not a Mandalorian based on how he's lived his life. So, but yes, that is that is true. Right? But now when he, that youth, they put that chain code in that he was a foundling of, of Jaster Morell, he is by descendant. He is Mandalorian. Like in my opinion, and I feel like other people will probably say the same thing, but Django was his. So there was a civil war, uh, Mandalorian civil war, and they went back to um, Concord Dawn, where Jaster Morell was from. Tors Vizsla killed Jaster in front of Django. Django took over for those new Mandalorians, which were fighting Death Watch. Um, I think it's going to be a big deal. It's but it's, but, it's possible for sure, especially because we yeah. haven't seen the armorer at all this season. So I wonder if she comes back into play towards the end. There's only two more episodes left. I love how you're holding up for the arm. I, is she I was such a pivotal I, role I in the first season? I think she's fucking toast. You think? I, I think no, I think, I think that's where it's all going to come together is the armorer and then and then Boba and his people are going to show up and they're going to realize that they, these are opposing sides trying mm. to come together and there's going to be some some real beef here. Mando's going to have to make a choice. Only when his son is concerned, right? Because right. he needs Boba's help. Mm. So he's just like... Mm. He's fucking. He put Bill Burr away, and now it's like, yeah, I might need this motherfucker's help. <laughs> like, I'm like, hold on, hold on. There isn't anyone else that knows about the Empire, like, except that dude. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm pretty sure Cara Dune's a pretty badass person, and yes, she's tied as a marshal, and they'll she'll probably make the right choice in the end and fucking help him. But still, it's like I'd have been like, you're gonna try and play the fucking. I'm a cop now. I can't help you. Well, she changed her mind real quick when he brought up the, that they have the kid. Right. So she was like, okay, game he, on. He yeah. should have just led with that. To be honest with you, that's what I'm saying. Like, why didn't you? Why play around? Just be like, they have my son. I need your help. Mm-hmm. Speaking of Cara Dune, thoughts on uh, her making a, a return cameo as a marshal now. She was a marshal. Now she's on the books. As, yeah, a sanctioned marshal as part of the law. Yeah. I that's probably my only complaint for this episode is I feel like they got there pretty unexpectedly. It was pretty, you know, jump to the gun. It, that was probably my th- my biggest problem with the entire episode is is that particular scene. I thought it was just a little choppy. She's boring to me. <laughs> that's uh that's Rodriguez's fault. He could have Yeah, well no, I mean I haven't liked her for a minute really, but <laughs> I liked her in season 1, but I haven't liked her much in season 2. Hmm. Yeah. They don't know what to do with her. I I will go back to uh that that opening scene life that you mentioned because I've been enjoying like the way they open these episodes. I feel like they do such a good job of like immediately kind of putting you in the mood or like showing like some downtime and and the downtime between like uh Din and and Grogu have been like f- spectacularly these last two um episodes like really kind of uh, showing you like. Uh, aside from all the action, like he is becoming a father outside of the sense of always oh, just kind of like survival and, and, you know, having to rescue Grogu. But it's like every episode, like you kind of just see like, you know, Grogu's uh, impact and, and effect on him um, just like resonate. Because he's even having that conversation with him. Like, he's you know, as, as soon him. as I, you know, as soon as I take you back, you know, they, they're going to be able to train you. I, I'm you're too powerful for me. And he's almost he's not necessarily saying he's saying, he's it, saying it to himself. Them. Right. Yeah. Right. That, that he's having that talk with himself. And you right. can almost see him like getting emotional because of it. Yeah. And honestly, I, I felt the emotion way more in that opening sequence rather than at the end of, of the previous episode where he's having to like, where he thinks he's going mm-hmm. to give Grogu uh, to Ahsoka. Like I, I thought he delivered this really well, like from that emotional uh, perspective. Even in, in the whole time, you have to give the, the credit to, to what's his name? Pedro Pascal. Pedro, Pedro Pascal. I said yeah, Oscar yeah. Isaac. Um, but you have to really give credit to him because he is acting so well without seeing, you know, really any of his face. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hoping these last two episodes give more uh, spotlight to him. I, I feel like these, these previous two, you know, we it was mainly about Ahsoka last one. This one, I feel like Boba Fett kind of stole the show. I'm hoping these last two, we kind of just stick with Mando and, and like giving him 
him more of like that screen time. We're gonna well, get a lot know. of Moff Gideon. Yeah, we are. We're gonna get a lot of Moff Gideon, <laughs> which I don't gonna... mind at all. He has the best cape villain walk. And it's gonna. <laughs> it is incredible the way he snaps around and just struts. Yeah, he's got a sweet ass. <laughs> Wait, what? Not a... <laughs> shut up, guys. That's not what I. Oh, and even man. the little grins, you know, when he's holding the dark saber. Ever seen one of these? And you're gonna poke your eye out. <laughs> All right, so with us being six episodes deep this season, um, we've got a fair amount of episodes. Uh, so so far for me to ask, what's been your favorite one so far, and why? Probably the Ahsoka one because I just like felt as soon as I saw it and saw Rosario, I I was at peace with it and very happy with the outcome of it and how they handled it. So uh, I think I just had a lot of anxiety built up towards that episode, and after it was over, I feel very happy with it, and that's probably my mm-hmm. favorite one so far. I'm glad you're doing better, Lars. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I would echo and say Ahsoka as well, just because that was a character that, you know, for my fandom, I had always heard about, but never actually seen live. And well, no one's seen her, seen her live in action. But that was my first experience with her in a viewing outside of YouTube, I should say. Um, but I would also say the episode before that, was it the episode before that? Or maybe two episodes before that? Two episodes, I think, um, with Bo Katan. I, I thought that those fight scenes with, with, you know, the other woman, the wrestler blanking on her name but i don't know her actual character name in in the show but i thought that those fight scenes in particular were really uh were definitive enough that we are going to see more of that crew not necessarily more of the ahsoka crew i think that we'll definitely see some bo katan um in these final two episodes honestly I'm, i'm gonna say the first episode the very first episode of the second season man it it because I, I was because I was wondering I'm like okay how are they gonna do this like what are they gonna do like will, will they will they am I back for the Mandalorian season two mm. am I back I don't know no, I question. don't know this season like we'll see and then I saw that first episode and I'm like I'm back baby <laughs> <laughs> better than ever do you think why do you think that Boba never went after the other guy that had his armor first he may I mean who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Like he, th- this is this is what I'm saying is that I think Boba Fett is very. He's become very. Look, when you get thrown into a ginormous damn sandworm, and then <laughs> you, you learn humility and really you, quick. Yeah, and then you escape <laughs> having your face, you know, dissolved by stomach acid for a long time. Somehow he fights his way out, right? And then he ends up wandering Tatooine. I, I feel like maybe he's just like. Hmm. You know, I'm old as fuck and I haven't really been training. So if I try to make a if I try to make a move on this dude, he may get the better of me and end up killing me. Plus, he's got my armor. He knows how to use it. He's flying around and fucking, you know, enforcing the law on this fucking place like nothing. I I I'm not good enough. Like uh, maybe I'll wait. And also there could be he could be in his own head about it. Who knows? Like that's why I'm in, he's interesting, but only as far as much as he is a shadowy reflection of what the Mandalorian could, it could become. Have, yeah, now that you say that, it could be a good instance where he knows where his armor is. So it's a matter of building yourself up in order to eventually take it. And then when somebody else takes it and takes off, maybe that was the catalyst. That I feel I like Boba Fett's going to have a moment of redemption. Hmm. I feel like he'll have a moment of redemption this season. You maybe. don't think it was this episode? Not at all. Hmm. No, no. There was self-interest involved. Well, Th- there right, was well, self-interest involved. There was a deal made. Sure. They kept their both ends of the deal. That's why we're helping, right? But I would say a moment of redemption requires him to go above and beyond the deal. It's got to be selfless, hmm. right? Because he's a piece of shit. He's, he's done some questionable things in his life, morally speaking. I, I guess for me, I, I'm, I'm on board with this episode being some inkling of, of redemption because the original deal between them was... You give me the armor, I ensure the safety of, of you and Grogu. Technically, Mando didn't give him his armor. He had to go get his own armor, hmm. and he could have cut the deal right then and there. But I, I thought there was some well, other. He's than, not like, redeeming the plot. That's just growth. No, no, absolutely not. No, That's no, just I, I don't think. Growth. I don't think fully redeemed. Not at all. But I think this is a good step in the right direction because he didn't have to. You know, it, it, he kind of is going above and beyond. You know, I'm. I'll, I will help you face the Empire to get back you there know, was mutual son. there was mutual gains I, I i wouldn't count him redeemed in the slightest he's done so much bad <laughs> shit Potter. he's done so much bad shit 
So I, I think my two. Well, I'm sorry. I think my favorite episode. He kissed um, Jabba the Hutt <laughs> for a long time on the mouth. I saw him do it. I saw him do it. It was gross. And then he laughed in my face. I think, honestly, it, it's a tie between this episode and episode two of the season, The Passenger. Only because the, the, the oh, Passenger. the Frog Lady. Yeah, the Frog Lady episode. <laughs> Only because at first, I, yeah, I, love it. I was not a fan of that episode. But on the second rewatch, I, it really grew on me. I mean, like, the, the, the difference in vibe. I mean, it felt like a, I was watching, like, a horror movie in, in Star Wars world. I like you know? how freaked out everybody got by that episode. Yes. Yeah, oh, it's, That's what yeah I exactly. It was like it, it had a, it had a, a, a memorable impact and and me being like kind of freaked out is, is not my favorite like feeling when i'm watching a show i don't really watch like scary stuff like that but oh, i know i really liked how they just decided to switch it up like it was a cool mm. monster kind of uh, uh episode and then we got to um and even like that ending with um um uh when we meet uh captain corvus and you know he has that quick kind of exchange of like you know you, you've done a lot of bad but we're gonna let you go because mm-hmm. you've kind of done a lot of, of greater good and it, it set the tone for me as far as like what world we're in, where it's like even the good guys are kind of in a weird gray area where they need all the help they can get. And they're, you know, yeah, they, they, they see a chance for Mandalorian. They it's see the something West, in man. Yeah. Everybody needs everybody There's in nuance. the Wild West. Yeah, exactly. You got to be able to see it. So I think those two might be my favorite. And I don't think there's any coincidence that they are also the two shortest episodes this episode. I felt like both of them were really tight, really like, you know, I got what it, it didn't need to have more than it needed. I felt like they were like, what do we need to tell this story for this episode and let's execute it really well. Hmm. So I think those two are, are my favorite um, episodes. Um, I wanted to give you guys a chance to maybe um, a- encapsulate any last uh, minute thoughts or, or you know something you guys haven't shared yet uh, regarding this episode for, before we uh, call it a day. I mean, it was a really short episode. I don't think we need to you know spend two hours dissecting a 30 minute episode. I think it was pretty straightforward. Uh, Lars, do you want to share any last minute thoughts? Um, I just really appreciate Star Wars, man. And uh, I think I think the younger generation is going to feel inclusive. There's a lot of female, you know, actresses involved. There's a lot more people of color involved in in this. I I uh, I couldn't help but sort of notice that um, in Boba's fight scene. Uh, almost like a very rhythmic like i could be making this up in my head but i almost felt like he was doing like the haka like like when he crossed his arms and shot that last blaster shot it seemed like this big powerful moment to me i just think that there's these little things maybe that that they're trying to put in there and include a lot of people in their cultures and little bits and pieces um but yeah that that's really it i just i really love star wars and i appreciate it no, it's definitely it, it's brought it's one of those shows that you can watch without being a fan or watching anything else, any of the other lore from Star Wars, any of the movies. And and I, I tell a lot of my friends this, like you can start the Mandalorian right now and you don't have to be aware of anything else. It it makes it more fun, of course, if you're aware of those things. But sure. um, it's definitely one of those shows that that anyone could start. I would say as far as this episode in particular, I'm really curious of who got the signal from Grogu. I think that we're going to have that answer by the end of this season. And who answers that is really going to set up, I think, uh, what the current fandom likes or dislikes. Because I think there is a good chance that it could be Luke. You got two episodes left, boys. Don't fuck it up. <laughs> and I th- a lot of fans are going to be really mad don't if it's fuck Luke. It up. Don't f- I don't care. I don't really? care who it is. I really don't. Hmm. Like, because honestly, fan shit does not matter. Hmm. Because it, if they have a good writer, they can make anything good. Hmm. I mean, like, they made The Mandalorian up, guys. He didn't exist before this. And it's a good show. It doesn't matter. It, they could, it could be fucking Ray somehow. It doesn't matter. Ooh, if if they, it's Ray, they will see, riot. Fuck them. Fuck them. Who gives a shit? That's kind of how it I It doesn't feel too. matter. It, these, it, all, I'm, all I care about is if they tell a good story like they currently have been doing. Hmm. They've been doing a good job. Like they, I've, I have, I've said it, I think, every episode. I have no complaints. I like the show a lot. I'm ready, I'm ready for the next episodes. But again... Don't you guys better fucking stick the landing, okay? Don't don't fuck it up. Don't you've been brave thus far. You've been you've been brave thus far in telling a good story and you know having fun with the universe and not contradicting canon, but more or less like, yeah, but that shit don't matter when it comes to writing a good story. We'll change it a little. We can retcon it, and people will forgive it. They'll forgive it if 
if the story's good, right? Same thing with comics, man. We've do, we've done we dealt with this a million times where it's like if you're a collector of comic books, the most rookie mistake you can make is saying, "Oh, I like Wolverine, so I'm going to collect Wolverine comics." You look at that guy like, "Ha, fucking noob." Like, no, that comic is good because uh Mark Silvestri is fucking drawing it and for some reason uh Scott LaBelle circa 1991 is writing it and that's why it's good. Follow those guys, right? So Favreau, Filoni, looking at you guys. And Lucas, because I know he's on there going, hey guys, um, can I can I come too? Is it all right? Um, I really like everything that's happening here. Don't fuck it up. You got my vote. I will say this episode, it doesn't feel boring, despite it being heavy on the action. And it's almost like one-sided, you know, uh, like there's no way these stormtroopers are going to overpower, you know, Finnick or Boba, um, which could have easily just been boring, a boring fight, you know, uh, um, an action sequence. But I thought it, it kept my attention. It didn't drag too long. Um, it was a great, I, I already said, but it's a great introduction to a uh, for a classic character, um, you know, being Boba Fett while bringing us back to a tighter scope regarding uh, Mando's journey. Uh, it's because you like gangsters, dog. You like <laughs> gangsters. And Boba Fett rolled up in there like, rah, there goes your fucking helmet. Rah, there goes your armor. Just like Lars was saying, like he was dancing. He wasn't fighting. And he no. fucking mauled those <laughs> but, bastards, those poor guys. Action aside, I, I do love seeing the, the parallels between Din and, and, and Boba and even, and even Django. You know, Django and Mando were both foundlings. They both went down very similar, but, you know, different roads. There is some, like, nuances there that, mm. that delineate both of them. And I think it's safe to say that, like, fatherhood had a profound change on them. So I wonder if Boba is, is foreshadowing in any way what Grogu could one day or possibly become, like, a, f- a ghost of a future alternative, kind of like warning. And I think it goes back to what C was saying, like, you know, Boba is also kind of like a... um. Uh, a, a walking lesson for mm-hmm. Mando, like, damn, if I don't take this, you know, role seriously, like, Grogu could easily become something like Boba, you know, experience well, the things. He or, thinks. or Moff Gideon, dude. Like, that's what this world. That's also what this fucking show is about. Is that being a parent is hard because there's always going to be fucking assholes out there trying to influence your kids, and always going to be trying to fucking taint them in some sort of way, right? There's always creepy people out mm-hmm. there, and. They're not always kids. Your kids aren't always going to be around you. You know, they got their own little lives too, whether they're at school or whatever. And, you know, it's your job to act as a good role model. And I think that's more or less what gives me tension when I watch the show. Not so much. I know Grogu's going to be fine. They're not going to fucking kill that little fucking moneymaker. They're not going to do it. Okay. (laughs) That is the the cutest cash cow I've ever seen. Seriously. That'd be (laughs) stupid to do it. But. What every time I watch a scene where Moff Gideon's like, you know, hey man, what's up? Because he hasn't killed him yet. Why? Because he wants to influence him, right? And you know, any other time you see like a weirdo in front of the the kid, it's like, oh man, god damn it! Like this is what happens when you let a fucking psychopath babysit your kid. You know, you're like, this is what's. It's like, ah. This is why my sister will not let me babysit my nephew. <laughs> why? Are you gonna light up a fucking dark saber and be like, you want to play you know with what it? This is? <laughs> yeah. All right, so we've got two episodes left in this season. Next week, next week's episode will be written by Rick uh, Fam Oye Iwa, um, who's no stranger to the series. He wrote two episodes in season one, um, episodes two, The Child, and episodes nine, The The, the Prisoner, back in season hmm. one. Uh, the latter, uh. the latter being the episode where Bill Burr's character Miggs Mayfield made his debut. So I think it's appropriate cool. that you know uh, uh, Rick returns to do an episode, possibly starring the character that he helped introduce. I love Good. that scene when the, it's like the red light flashing and you see Bill Burr's face, and all of a sudden <laughs> Din is just getting closer and closer. Yeah, I think that's great. my favorite scene. That was the last. Ball. That was the last piece Din needed for his crew was a fucking <laughs> Boston in space. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I wanted to know from you guys: uh, Does this episode? Th- does this change or? alter your idea or guess or of how the season will end hmm, i don't really know where it's going to end but i do see that big mashup you know avengers end game coming hmm. i would say probably it changes in respect to grogu embracing the dark side hmm. i think that you definitely saw some hints of that towards the end of the episode and and even Ahsoka was afraid to train him. And so with this particular episode, you see why she was afraid to train him is because he's easily swayed to the dark side. I, and maybe this is going over my head, but I don't see that as like him being 
swayed by the dark side like he's fighting for survival i felt like you well know, it, you'll he's, notice he's it, lashing out in uh, fear yes but of i course, guess that's but i think in that it. respect you've seen him do these uh questionable decisions before mm. and he makes that same similar face like any time that he sees like din is in trouble then he's gonna try to you know fuck up whoever you know the arm wrestling scene with cara dune mm. comes to mind where he is gonna just force choke her because he, she he thinks that she's harming his father perhaps so so I think that that's a, a possibly a good indication that we could see him swayed. Lars told me that he was rooting whenever uh, Grogu was choking out Card. <laughs> that's what he told me about. This. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that whenever he was uh, whooping ass with the stormtroopers, it was sort of uh, the stormtroopers were grabbing certain body parts, like they weren't being force choked exactly. So I almost feel like that was like on purpose to try to show you that he wasn't trying to kill them. Right. Like I don't know, they were like grabbing at their shoulders and yeah. like making them contort their bodies in ways and then smash them into each other. Yeah, he was permanent. So I, def- I definitely see what Blythe is saying, but I feel like it's not so evil as more self-defense. I want to know what was going on before he was that like, happened, before he started they're just... They're like, we're just trying to feed you a hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck, dude? Be cool. You yeah. know what, man? And something I forgot to mention... Um, Let's not forget that Stranger Things is popular. And let's also not forget that John fucking Favreau and Dave Filoni and George Lucas probably all know that. All right. This is very much an Eleven vibe, which, by the way, themes of that show are basically, Papa, can you hear me? You know, it's a lot of that shit, too. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping they don't just rehash the same fucking themes we've seen in Stranger Things. I would really, I would be fucking bored. I just don't want another a little eleven running around. It's fucking stupid. Just, just keep it still about the Mandalorian, right? Like the more they start focusing on like this child has powers, you know, like it's like okay, cool, move on, move on, got it, cool. Yes, he can do weird things. Got it. We've known he can do weird things in season one. Got it, cool. Uh, how does that strengthen the relationship? Is you know the Mandalorian? What does he have to do? The moral thing. I don't know. It's very Stranger Things. I hope it doesn't turn that way. I will go, go ahead and say that um, I have been enjoying not knowing as you know, not knowing as much what in regards like the next episode, like these last three. Like I said <laughs> in the previous one, did you like, mean for that to sound? Uh, Guys, I've really been enjoying <laughs> not knowing anything. Well. Well, like, th- there's nothing to really look forward to other than letting it unfold. Right, I-, I think I said right. in the last episode, it felt like waiting for the Dave Filoni Ahsoka uh, cameo was, like, the thing to look forward to. Now that that's out the way, I'm more excited. Like, okay, let's get back to yep. the Lone Wolf and Cub yep. story. Thank you. Know? you. Yes. I don't, you know, I-, I, don't, I don't need a springboard for other shows. Granted, it, they were entertaining shows. The Ahsoka episode was great, but these last three like this one was such a well. I think I like this episode so yeah. much because it just came out of nowhere. I was like, yes, and that's something Boba you Fett, mentioned. Back to a tighter scope. That's something that very, very important to mention that a lot of TV shows will do is that they'll film a pilot within the show without the audience knowing it to test. They did it with Supernatural. They tried to do an episode where it was like, we kind of want a show about this to happen. So they made an entire episode. And it flopped. It was it's so it's so bad. Like you can look it up online. Like this is fucking terrible. But it's ha- it's like you yeah they've done it in more than one show. I think they ah, what was the other one I, I I wanted to bring up. But I I I am not interested in introducing new tent poles into the Star Wars like franchise. I want a nice story. And I think the ending. Uh, I think like you you mentioned it in the beginning, which was perfect. The fact that. Boba stays and he's willing to help. Now it's like this new big power three with characters that you know we're, we're still very unfamiliar. Boba's been around for a long ass time, but we're still you know we're still learning things about him. And we got Finnick, and now Kara's going to be brought in, and Migs. It's like okay, yes, we're we're bringing it back to like you know the man, the dirty dozen, exactly. They're all criminals. So we'll see how things transpire next week. No mention of the dark troopers. Oh my god, it was cool. Yeah. It was cool. I don't really know much else about them except for that they're cool and they're powerful. There you go. That's it. That's all you need to know. <laughs> yeah. I, f- I figure we'll probably see him next episode or something. It's kind of why they yeah. put him at the end. It's yeah. like, yeah, okay. They no. didn't really do much. Yeah, the no. cutest, the best thing was whenever he did a little like uh, thermal vision and you saw the sad expression on Grogu's face when he's being zoomed up with them. Oh, stop. Stop. There was way too many sad parts mm-hmm. in this. Lars, Blythe, C, thank you guys so much for hanging with me this episode. I didn't I think have a choice. We are at the end of our show, Short Box <laughs> I live <Nation>. here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. 
Jeez, I know hanging out with me is such a pain in the ass. <laughs> Lars, thank you for calling in, brother. Yeah, no thank problem, you so much buddy. for spending time with me. Lars is like, so I'm sweet. only here to talk about Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> Short Box Nation, that is the end of our show. How was it? Did we miss anything? Do you want to chime in with a thought or share something with us to read next episode? Let us know by sending an email at theshoreboxjacks at gmail.com. I personally want to recognize and thank the people who made this episode possible. Our sponsor, Gotham City Limit, my panel today, Blythe, Lars, and Cesar. Thank you guys so much. And a special praise goes out to our Patreon subscribers who help us keep the lights on here at Shorebox Studios. If you enjoyed the podcast and are in a position to support the show with a small donation, consider becoming a Shorebox patron. We'll reward you with bonus episodes and other perks. Visit patreon.com slash the short box to find out more. Thanks again for tuning in. You could be listening to any other podcast, but you're here with us, and that means a lot. We'll be back next week to cover episode seven of The Mandalorian. And of course, don't forget to check out our regular weekly episodes that drop every Wednesday, especially if you're a fan of comic books. We have a great one coming up later this week about Frank Miller's Daredevil, so look out for that on your favorite podcast app. In the meantime, have a great week and continue to make mine and yours short box. It is the way.